Funding for the art show is made possible by Montgomery County Arts and Cultural District and viewers like you. Thank you. In this edition of the art show, a local dance company doesn't wait for the audience to come to them. Our street performances are designed to bring audiences to the table and necessarily not have them come to a theater. A Cherokee artist represents his heritage. Edwin George is almost a textbook example of what a folk artist is. Two artists construct an outdoor ode to a forgotten era. We recreated our grandmother's living room and put it outside. It's all ahead in this edition of The Art Show. Hello, I'm Rodney Veal and this is The Art Show. Each week we bring you local, regional, and national stories about remarkable artists and arts organizations. First up this week, SMAG Dance Collective is a Dayton contemporary fusion dance company founded by Michael Grooms in 2003. The company's eclecticism and movement, choice of venue, and its dancers push the boundaries of contemporary dance. Who is Michael Grooms? Uh, Michael Grooms is an entertainer. Michael Grooms is someone that enjoys people, he loves to have fun, and he loves to uh, interact with people, and more importantly, he loves to entertain people. Michael Grooms is also a dancer and choreographer and founder of Smag Dance Collective, a community-based dance troupe for the community, by the community. Smag's mission is to provide opportunity for dancers, uh, provide opportunity for people that we think would not get the opportunity otherwise. This could be because maybe they don't have the training, uh, maybe they need to spend more time at home with their children, any number of, of factors that would preclude them from dancing with another company. Dance is my passion. It's been a part of my life for my whole life. I love it. I love performing. Um, I love being able to give back what I love to the community. I got back into dancing because I was feeling unfulfilled. It's definitely an outlet for me, so I can't really picture not doing it because I've been there before and I was unhappy. <laughs> Ever since I was little, I was dancing around my house. Um, and I just never stopped. It is a huge joy for me and it's what I love to do. Part of our mission is to bridge the gap between artists and other artists in the community. So we've created uh, works that allow us to do that, where we can have collaborations with other artists. And another uh, part of our mission is to educate and entertain diverse audiences. It's so different than anything I've ever done. So it's thrilling for me because I'm used to a stage with lights and wings and an audience right in front of you. But um, in different venues, when you're outside, there's people all around you. Uh, we did a piece with the fountains on Monument Street. Sometimes we dance on brick and that's interesting because it's not a traditional dance floor. So it's just totally different and it's really thrilling for me. Our audience is unique and different. We've got primarily people that don't go to the theater watching what we're doing. And it's because of our philosophy of taking it to the people as opposed to the people coming to us to see what we're doing. We want people to feel comfortable and our street performances are designed to bring audiences to the table and necessarily not have them come to a theater. A lot of times people think in terms of going to a theater, they gotta get dressed up, they've gotta do all these special things to go to the theater. Dance should be accessible to everybody. A lot of times you have to pay um, 50 or 75 or $100 to go see a show, um, but a lot of people just can't afford it. But just seeing us dance out on the street, like in the Oregon district, you know, they're already there. I think it's cool that it's put in their daily lives rather than, you know, having to dress up and spend all that money and go out. Street performances aren't the only things that set SMAG apart from other local dance companies. The style of dance also strays from the traditional. We're an adult company, and we focus on a fusion of all types of styles, so we don't stick to just one style of dance. We um, pretty much do everything. We do ballet, modern, jazz, hip-hop. To me, contemporary dance pushes the boundaries as well. I think it kind of breaks the rules a little bit. Ballet is all about holding your form. Uh, it's very important because it's the foundation in dance, uh, but contemporary dance uh, allows a little more freedom. 
contemporary dance is a form of training that uh, utilizes modern dance, it utilizes ballet, and it utilizes jazz techniques. And what it does is it creates a, a more uh, diverse dancer, uh, a dancer that can do everything as opposed to a dancer that can specialize in something. They can now do ballet, they can now do modern dance, and they can look comfortable doing it on stage. So it gives more flexibility to choreographers to be able to create with bodies like that. It's really interesting watching this phenomenon occur, which is people are, are starting to look at dancers as athletes and as dancers we've always known all along that we're athletes and the reason we've known is, is the work that we do. And dance, you have to be able to do both right-handed and left-handed. So you have to be able to turn to your right, you have to be able to do turns to your left because choreographers, they're going to want you to do both turns on the right and the left as well as be able to jump on your right and jump on your left. So you have to train both sides of your body to be equal. The athleticism has always been there and people are now starting to recognize and dancers. SMAG's Cadillac stage performance is the Urban Nutcracker. The idea started from a desire to diversify the traditional dance audience. How? For starters, replace the classic Nutcracker soundtrack with all popular music. Where the traditional Nutcracker takes place during a Victorian kind of setting in the 1800s, we now brought it forward to 2000. There's no resemblance to any of the Nutcracker soundtrack. Uh, and we did that on purpose because, again, we wanted to get away from the traditional soundtrack and do stuff that people can identify with from what they hear on the radio, in their cars, uh, at the clubs they go to and places like that. It's part of our seasonal performance series, which features Smagmare, which is like a haunted house nightmare production that takes place on the street. Contemporary dance really never gets boring. There's really no boundaries. That's why I like it. In addition to holding full-time jobs, grueling rehearsals, and quarterly performances, these dancers also have a commitment to developing the next dance audience. We have a program called Dancing Across Dayton. It's our dad um, program where we like to offer an opportunity to kids who might not take dance on a regular basis. They may have never taken dance or been exposed to it. We reach out to schools in that community, community centers, anywhere we can just try and go and give kids a chance to see what dance is all about. We kind of teach them um, different fundamental bases of um, creative movement or just pedestrian movement, things that anybody could do, putting them in different dance sequences, rhythmic patterns, things like that. So it's just a way that we can share some of what we love with the community. We still need to develop that next audience, and if we don't develop them, then our discipline as dancers, as performing artists, is going to go away because we don't have an audience to watch it anymore. So we have to get in there and work with them younger. And not only that, but stimulate them from a, a creative perspective because they may be future dancers. Celebrating its 10th season, SMAG Dance Collective, led by Michael Grooms, does not lack in passion, creativity, nor experimentation. Sometimes I think that as dancers we tend to think it's more so about our artistic vision and, and what our voice is and we forget about the fact that without the people sitting out there in the audience watching us, our artistic vision or voice would be unheard. Nobody would care because it would just be about what we want. So it's a really self-serving moment at that point. I want to entertain people. I want to do something that's going to make them happy and make them feel good. So my choreography tends to revolve around that type of, of movement. Michael's so fun. <laughs> he has great choreography and he definitely brings a lot of joy to the group. He has a great personality and he just is all about dance, so we love him. <laughs> I'd rather die on stage. Uh, you know, I, I have no plans of retirement. Retirement is something that I couldn't even fathom doing. Uh, I'm a dance until I can't move and even if I'm in a wheelchair, I'll probably figure out a way of getting out there and, and doing something. Be sure to check smagdance.org for their performance calendar. You'll also be able to sign up for news and updates. Chances are, if there's an outdoor event happening in Dayton, SMAG will be there. Oftentimes, art is used as a means of preserving culture and its people. As an Ohio Heritage Fellowship honoree, Edwin George helps to keep the Cherokee culture vibrant with his colorful, tradition-inspired paintings.
I was born in, it's called Cherokee, North Carolina, back in the, towards Smoky Mountains. I live in the mountains, and, uh, and we lived in a log house. My mother had a wooden stove, and we had a fireplace. We didn't have no bed, I just sleep on the floor. It was just one big room, didn't have no rooms. Yeah, I went to school, but I didn't finish. I just quit halfway to ninth grade. I didn't finish it. My daddy just brought me down here. I couldn't speak no English. I was speaking my own language, you know, it's, it's called Cherokee. Edwin George is almost a textbook example of what a folk artist is. He grew up in the Cherokee culture and community. He grew up using Cherokee language, which is now a rare form of language that very few practitioners use. And Ed is filled with the stories, the visual images, and the feeling of Cherokee culture. So when we see what Edwin does, we meet the Cherokee culture. So he signifies a community of folk art. Folk art is a distinctive type of art that is made by people who represent their own community's values, tastes, and aesthetics. A folk artist shares with the world what he or she has learned from community, from their family, even from within an occupation. It's the kind of art that happens when people transmit what they know in an oral, informal way say, an apprenticeship between a master artist and a younger person, or even within a family. Started in 1984, working against the university. And later on, I was sketching all the time. I was really, I was an artist, and I, I just started my own. The self-taught artist. What I think is fascinating about Edwin George is, in my experience, he's one of the few people I know who essentially had a spiritual calling to start creating art. He came from an art community. He came from people within his own family who were master craftspeople, such as his mother's sister, who was a basket maker. And Ed was filled with stories from his Cherokee family. But something happened inside of him that made him just one day say, I have to put this in visual form. And pop, out came his artwork, which makes it very powerful, very immediate, and amazingly organized for a person who didn't learn in an apprentice fashion. Well, I always sit there, sometimes I think, should I paint this? Then if I can think a story, then I'll paint that. I dream sometimes. I can know one dream, I can't get started. How the dog made the Milky Way. A Cherokee family found that something has been stealing cornmeal from their corn crib. They would make the cornmeal from beating the corn in a hollow log with a log beater. They decided to wait one night and watch the crib to see who was stealing the cornmeal. That night, they spotted a huge dog coming from the crib with cornmeal in his mouth. They grabbed their beaters and pans and raced out, making so much noise that the dog ran, spilling the cornmeal from his mouth. He jumped up into the sky, and as he ran across the heavens, he scattered cornmeal. That white trail he left behind, we call the Milky Way. What is exciting to me about Edwin's painting is his remarkable use of color and design. He is extremely interested in what a field is. A field is something that we can consider the background for a subject. Edwin dissolves the difference between a subject and a field. Everything is happening together in the same plane at the same time. So it's a jam-packed visual. They're crowded together, but they're beautifully colored. And this motion that he builds into it makes for just a very exciting visual experience. First, the be surprised what I go to. I put four coats of white first. And when I get through, I go again about five, six times with a small brush. 
That's why it takes so long. I'll mix the color, all kinds of color. If it looks good, it goes on there. If it's pink, you put pink both sides, even it up. Well, I put a bird in that blue cook, cardinal, chickadee, and I put them in there. Next time I put, put flowers in there. How he came to understand how to do color coloration in that way is mysterious to me because it's as if he knew it from his dream state. And in fact, he talks about a lot of this as representing sort of spiritual interior parts of who he is. The color must be in his mind. Edwin does something rather interesting in his painting, and that is he represents the Cherokee syllabary, its language, which is different from what United States American alphabet is. It actually has 86 letters, and it's a rare language these days. So we have this interesting sense of painting as a way of preserving language. Just keep it like this, put it in there. And uh, if I put a rabbit, I, I call it jistu. I just put it in there. We call it squirrel, shilole. And yona is a bear, so that's why I put it in there. We need artists like Edwin to understand what it means to be a person of history as you are an Ohioan. In Ohio, we're all here as migrants and immigrants in some fashion or another. My grandmother might have come from Russia. His grandparents came from North Carolina. We have a sense of history being enriched when we meet an artist who lets us see a little bit more toward the past and toward the future. Edwin won the Ohio Heritage Award because he's a clear master. There is no other person that I know of in the state of Ohio who does Cherokee art as beautifully, as competently as Edwin does. He came to it late in life, that's a fact, but he came fully blown, just like Venus out of the clamshell from mythology. Edwin had been thinking Cherokee thoughts and Cherokee images his whole life. So he started out rather masterfully, which is a surprise because say in fiddle tradition, it takes years to build expertise. Edwin has expertise, he's got importance as a bearer of a specific cultural tradition, and he shares it broadly with the public. And that is what the Ohio Heritage Award recognizes. While Edwin settled in Northern Ohio, the Miami Valley does have a rich tradition for Native Americans. If you haven't gone, plan a visit to Sun Watch Indian Village, just south of downtown Dayton. The Village and Interpretive Center offer exploration and learning both indoors and out all year round. Are you an artist or know an artist with an interesting story? Pitch it to us. Send an email to theartshow at thinktv.org. Include contact information and links to performances or art samples online. Finally, we found this great story coming out of Texas. The Third Ward neighborhood in Houston was once a thriving hub of African-American culture and business, full of mom and pop shops like the Beauty Box, a former beauty parlor that fell on hard times with the rest of the neighborhood. Now, two artists have reimagined the Beauty Box as a community meeting space with a nod to the past and a mission to help revitalize the area. My name is Robert Hodge. My name is Philip Pyle. And this and is the, the Beauty, beauty Box. Box. We are in the Beauty Box, and the Beauty Box is like a public installation that's kind of highlighting the um, time period from the 1960s before integration and Third Ward. About three years ago, the founder of Project Royal Houses, Rick Lowe, gave me a studio house. And inside this house, I found this, I found the chest of Third Ward back in that time period. And I mean, the lawns were immaculate. I mean, like, I mean, nicely yeah. cut, the kids were dressed great, the houses were painted. Yeah. It was like this sense of pride. I was like, wow, this is, this is, this is not third world I kind of know. I know certain parts of this, but like, this is amazing. And so when we kind of got here, we kind of got the idea. We kind of want to recreate that time period and like, what happened? And so some people say it was integration. When you are allowed to leave, you're like, well, I kind of want to explore and like, you know, this is saying I made it living here now. And so when those people left, that was a big, chunk of people that are really progressive doing things and they left, you know, and yeah. so 
it just changed the whole landscape of Third Ward. And then you have, you know, of course, drugs that kind of got in the mix, but that time period was like a really special time. I feel like their kids left. They stayed, they got old, and their kids left. Well, this, the space was abandoned, so you gotta think about this space being raw, with like, you know, trash and needles, and it's right directly across from a playground. We recreated our grandmother's living room and put it outside. We put up um, pretty much uh, plywood, and then we covered with a uh, wallpaper, a roller that we got from London. And so this, this initially lets you like just put the paint um, in the roller and then roll out. But it looks, it makes the wallpaper design. And then from that point, we just kind of started getting loading the, the work in. Yeah, and then we the bolted furniture. everything down. Our stuff was glued and still screwed in, but yeah. that didn't help everything. So at that yeah. time period, you definitely had uh, Coretta and Martin, but you definitely had JFK. And Jackie, you my, definitely had yeah. a Jesus somewhere in your house in that time period. Like yeah. those things were like. Yeah, my grandmother actually has that exact image in her house of JFK and Jackie. Yeah. And then on her um, kitchen table, she has uh, pictures of Jesus underneath uh, the plastic covering. The grandmother didn't necessarily have like, a, you didn't know what style she was going yeah, for yeah. that day, <laughs> but you definitely knew she liked flowers and she liked chicken. <laughs> This guy yeah. from the neighborhood, he came in and he, like, he was like, when I saw this, this table, I almost cried. This is the same table that uh, my mother wouldn't let me eat on at, at, for dinner. And he, he just loved it. He said, I promise nobody will mess with the space. And for the most part, nobody stole <laughs> yeah. big items. You know, little yeah. things were stolen, but yeah. he seemed really touched. And they really touched yeah. me because that was somebody who wasn't in the art world. He wasn't a buyer or a collector. Yeah. Man, that made this whole space, like every, no matter what happens, yeah. that night was like the most special to me because that guy connected, they knew exactly where we were coming from with it. More than about telling the story, also we wanted to activate a space that was nothing. Because right. there's so many spaces in the third ward that need to be activated. And so we kind of like wanted to just be that kind of forefront, like saying, take a space in your neighborhood or that part of third ward you're in and activate it. Make it into something else because you can you change the landscape when you do that. It take a second to just think about like that time period, maybe like, like a family respect, or maybe that sort of thing. We're here now and a lot of young people are moving back. And so we just want to like, you know, kind of have these discussions on what can we do? Like, you know, how can we just convince people to like, you know, man, pick up the trash. You're drinking a beer, it's a trash can right here, just throw it away. I mean, a lot of people don't know, so you can't get mad. It's just, that's what they've seen their whole life. And so we just want to like lead that discussion on what can we do? We're here now, we want to change the landscape. Are you going to join us and get third world back to like that, you know, that really great community that we want to see. We've had two movie screenings. Uh, we had a Monopoly Club meeting uh, where everybody came out and played Monopoly. And then two concert series and... Uh, and then artist talks. That way we can talk to elders, to young people, and we kind of dialogue and like kind of come up with some solutions and not just talk, but like things we can put down on paper and some things everybody can commit to doing. We are planning to have like a family dinner like the last day, like invite all our families out. And we're just gonna eat out here for the last time before it breaks down. And my grandmother asked that when, when we're done with this, because she have the chickens. Yeah. <laughs> she was like, just make sure you bring me those chickens. I love the idea of this space being used for concert series. A similar thing happened at the corner of 4th Street and Wayne Avenue in Dayton. Garden Station is a collaborative revitalization project transforming a vacant lot into a vibrant art park and community garden. Check them out at gardenstation.org or better yet, go see it for yourself. To view any of tonight's stories again or watch an episode in its entirety, watch The Art Show on demand at thinktv.org slash theartshow. You'll also find bonus features and extended interviews on select artists. And that wraps it up for this edition of The Art Show. Keep the local arts community thriving by going out there and supporting it. Until next time, I'm Rodney Veal, and thanks for watching.
Funding for the art show is made possible by Montgomery County Arts and Cultural District and viewers like you. Thank you.